actually, I don't know if it's from Mississippi, but when I heard it, it was in Mississippi, okay? Because I'm from Mississippi. I was born and raised. Went to elementary and junior high and high school in Mississippi. So this is what, and actually, I think I heard it from like my Sunday school teacher, okay? This is what I heard. It is better to keep your mouth shut and let people assume you're stupid than to open your mouth and remove any doubt. It is better to keep your mouth shut and let people assume you're stupid than to open it and remove any doubt, which means, anyway, it's just a funny little saying. Now, this is what, but this is a biblical proverb. Proverbs 17, 28. Proverbs 17, 28. Let me go to it here. I'm going to be Proverbs 17, 28. This is what the Bible says, and it's remarkably similar. Okay, this is actually in the Bible. This is what it says. It says, even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. What that basically means is you can be a big idiot. You cannot have any brains or common sense or whatever. But sometimes if you'll go around and just keep your mouth shut, people will, th will not know that you're actually not very smart. Okay? You, they'll be like, man, he must always be deep in thought. He's always just thinking. He must be really smart. Whereas if you opened up your mouth, they would, they would, they would you know, find out that that's not really the case. So, even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. Now, I don't usually do sermon series, but this may be a ser the first of a series of two sermons. Okay, today it's about shutting up. Maybe next week we'll see. Maybe we'll do the power of speaking up. Okay, which is extremely important. But today, the only side I really want to dwell on is, is when it's time is keeping your mouth shut and when that's an excellent, an excellent thing to do. Okay, so Proverbs 17, 28, so we saw that. So let me ask you a question. This, is, this may be a short sermon today. Is your mouth cured? Is your mouth cured? Everybody say cured. Now cured, this, you know, in English this verb cure, uh, I think basically has, it has two possible meanings. The main meaning, the main meaning is whenever you are sick and someone like a doctor cures you. Okay, you have a sickness, you know, a disease, and you take medicine, and then you're cured. Okay, you know, that guy was poisoned, but they administered an antidote, now he's cured. Okay, so that's one, and that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good definition, is your mouth cured, because your mouth may be sick. You may have a sick mouth, and I'm not talking about your lips and tongue, I'm talking about the things you say. But there's another meaning, there's another meaning to the word cured. Let's see what I have up here. Some foods are preserved by salting, or maybe a mix of salt and sugar, okay? For example, if you take a pig, if you slaughter a pig, and you, you take its leg, one of its legs, and you, I don't know how this all works, you like cover it in sugar or salt, salt and sugar, maybe just salt, whatever, maybe in a brine solution, something happens to it, the salt that they put on that pig leg, on that pork, that salt kills germs and it keeps the ham, it becomes ham. It, it was a, you know, piece of pork leg, now it becomes ham. And it keeps that ham from rotting, okay? For, I don't know how that works, you know, and they also use smoke. Smoke, I think, can be an also, another factor in that. So salt kills germs and keeps food from rotting, okay? And when you do, if I'm not mistaken, whenever you take something like a piece of pork and you do this to it, it's called curing it. It cures, okay? So, is your mouth cured? So, on the one hand, that can mean, is your mouth sick? Was your mouth sick and has it, has it been made new by the power of the Lord? The other thing is, has your mouth been salted? And let me talk about this. I want to talk about the things you say, and I have two scriptures, Colossians 4.6 and Ephesians 4.29. Let's look at Colossians. Okay, you know, people go around and we say a lot of stuff with our mouths, okay? And we can say good things, we can say bad things, we can say just fluff in between neither good nor bad things. But I'm afraid a lot of times what we tend to do is say stuff that we should not. So Colossians 4 6 says this 4 6. It says, Let your conversation be always full of grace seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone 
Okay? Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So here it is. Your conversation is seasoned with salt. How do you season your conversation with salt? You like eat popcorn before you, you know, do you pour salt as you speak and let the flow of breath be salted? No. This is what I think. This is my interpretation. Whenever, whenever in Colossians it says, let your conversations be seasoned with salt, I believe that salt is a symbol of grace. And do you know what salt does? Do you know what grace does? It keeps the bad things at bay. It keeps the bad things like germs or whatever from taking over. Do you know Jesus said that we are the salt of the earth. He said you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. And what salt does, if you cure fish or cure pork or cure meat or whatever, is it sucks out all of the water, something like this, it sucks all the water out of the microbes and then salt goes into the microbes and ultimately somehow they burst. I don't know. It kills the germs and it keeps the bad things from causing it to rot. Now sometimes when we talk, we have negative, we complain, we say negative things, we criticize, whatever, and it's like rotten speech. So let's see what uh, Ephesians 4.29 says. Ephesians 4.29. This is what it says. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Okay, let's read it again. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for, for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. I like it a little better in the King James that says something like this. Don't let any corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Okay. But it says only that which is good for edification, which is building up, so that it may impart grace to the hearer. Okay, so here, here we have again, we have we have this idea of corrupt, rotten communication. That's what it means. It says, don't let rotten communications. The stuff you're saying is death and it's full of worms and maggots and germs, okay? Don't let rotten communication come out of your mouth. But only stuff that is going to build other people up that will impart grace. And that's the salt. That's the salt. Grace. I'm going to, when I talk to you, I want the words that I say. I'm not saying I'm always going to be quoting scriptures or whatever. But generally, the words that I say, I want them to lift you up. I want them to make you feel better. I want you to feel encouraged and not brought down. Okay? I want salt in my words. I want grace in my words that are going to build you up. I don't want rotten speech. So the question with, the, 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 with relation to the title, what is the power of shutting up? The power of shutting up is when you don't have anything good to say, you don't say anything at all. Okay? It's great to have a, a, the Bible says that what a, a, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver. So if you have a good word, it's great to speak it. If you have an encouraging word. But if you don't, if you don't, sometimes it's good to just shut your mouth. Okay. Let's talk about bitter waters. Your mouth can, your, your, well, your mouth, your heart can be compared to a well. And when you draw water up out of that well, it's like water coming, you know, the, it's like your mouth speaking. That's the water that comes out of the well of your heart. The Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay, so when you talk, you're letting forth, you're letting loose what stuff that is in your heart. And people that are hurt, people that are, you know, if they've been wounded in their heart, that when they speak, this bitter water comes up. And they're like, oh, I'm not worth anything. You're not worth anything. Who's seen Toy Story 3? You've seen Toy Story 3? Lotso, the bear. Lotso hugging bear. He was rejected. He had rejection. He was hurt. And he was bitter. And then how did he view himself and others? In the movie, he says, You're, you know, she's just a piece of plastic. We're all headed for the dumpster anyway. And he was speaking out of the bitterness of his heart. To, anyway... What's in people's heart comes out. When people are happy, happiness comes out. You know, people are angry, angriness comes out. 
What's coming out of your well? What's coming out of the well of your heart? Let's look at the story. Exodus chapter 15, 20 through 25. Short little passage. This is after Moses had led the Israelites, Israelites out of Egypt. Okay, so he, they go there through the mighty, miraculous power, you know, miracle working power of God. They come out of Egypt. They escape Pharaoh. They escape slavery. But now they're in the desert. And what are they going to do for food and water? So Exodus 15, 22 through 25. Here we go. It says, Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. Okay? When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah. I believe Marah means bitter. So the people grumbled. They complained. Okay? They, they were not happy. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? What are we going to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. The water became fit to drink. Okay, and then it says, There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Okay. So let me tell you about this story in Exodus. They're going along. They're in the desert. They've been miraculously delivered from slavery. If you watch the Prince of Egypt or the Ten Commandments, you see the movie versions, the Hollywood versions of this. You know, the plagues and the Red Sea parts, and they go through, and Pharaoh's army drowns and all this stuff. But now, three days later, it's almost as if they've forgotten that because they're, they're, they're convinced that the Lord can't provide water for them, you, one would think. So they come to a place and they, they find water, but it's nasty. They taste it, they're like, you know, it's bitter. It's like, co- I hate coffee. People love coffee. I know most people love coffee, and there's an industry of coffee Starbucks, and they're making millions and billions of dollars. But I just, to, me, to me, it's bitter, okay? What, sorry, didn't mean to get off on that. They tasted this water and it was bitter and they, and they can't drink it. And so Moses cried out to the Lord and God showed him a stick. God showed him a piece of wood, piece of a tree. And you can debate this. You may, not, you may disagree, or, but this is the way I see it. The stick, when you see sticks and trees, a lot of times it seems like that's, sometimes anyway, that's a picture of the cross. That's the cross of Jesus. That's a picture of the cross, even though the cross was thousands of years in the future. It's like the cross went into that which is bitter, went into that which was bitter, and it made it sweet. It made it drinkable. Okay, there's another story I didn't, I didn't put up here, but it was concerning, uh, I wish I would have researched this. It was like uh, Elisha. Maybe it was Elijah. Anyway, one of, the, one of those guys, and, and there was a well, and the well was in the town, and the well was, the water was making people sick. And, and, and the prophet says, bring some salt in a new bowl. Bring salt. And he put that salt in the well, and it made the water sweet. So the question is, what's coming out of your well? And have you let, has grace, has salt come in and fix your bitter waters? Has the cross, has the gospel, you know, the power of God come and turned your bitterness, your, your, your hurt and wounds and anger into sweetness? There's the question. Because if it hasn't, you would do well to probably just shut up. Here's one more scripture. James 3, 9 through 12. Okay, here we go. James. Three, nine through 12. Here it goes. It says, this is what the apostle James says. With the tongues, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? 
My brothers and sisters, can a, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Okay. So James is talking about the tongue or the mouth. And he says, you know, on the one hand, on Sunday morning, we're like, oh, praise the Lord. You know, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. And, and we, we, you know, we're praising the Lord. But then come Monday morning, we're like, man, she said this and he said that. And she's, you know, she's so ugly. And can you believe what he was wearing? And, you know, this is so stupid. And I hate my teacher. And so on the one hand, you've got, you know, praise the Lord. God is so good. And on the other hand, you know, the next day or next minute, you're like, you know, complain and grumble or whatever else, gossip. And James is saying this shouldn't be. You shouldn't have, you can't have a well that's like, it's bitter one moment and then it's sweet the next. Or, you know, it's sweet the next, sweet one moment and bitter the next and going back and forth. So it's the same analogy or similar analogy of these bitter, salty, or, you know, the bitter waters, okay? Now, sometimes, this is what I think. This isn't in the Bible. This is what I think. Sometimes when you're with a group of people you don't know real well, it's hard to make conversation. And I imagine you've all been in this situation. You may be in a school group or a work group or just on a bus or you're stuck together with a number of people and you don't really know what to say and you know nobody's really caught a topic of, on, of conversation that's really interesting and I've noticed I think in my observation sometimes what it's easy to do is start talking about something negative because you know what everybody has something negative they've thought about so, I don't know, you can either start talking about how slow the service is, or you can start talking about how you hate it when airline stewardesses give you peanuts, or you can talk about how you hate such and such a teacher. And, and it's, it's really easy with a group of people, especially people you don't know, to just sit around and start complaining. You can complain about the government, complain about the weather or whatever, and just everybody kind of jumps on board. And wow, at least... <laughs> At least we're talking. At least it's not awkward silence. You know, at least there's conversation going. But unfortunately, what you've got is this, these bitter waters coming out. Maybe there's not a bunch of bitterness in your heart, but you've kind of jumped on that bandwagon. So that's what you're doing. You're just going with it. At times like these, it would probably be better to just keep your mouth shut. It would be better to just shut up. Okay? It would be better to not say anything at all. And sometimes that is hard to do. Sometimes it is hard to just sit there and not say anything. Now, on the, so, so we're talking about the power of shutting up, the power of being still. On the one hand, if there's bad stuff in your heart, I, you know, I, I want you to deal with it. I encourage you to let the Lord deal with that, take the bitterness out of your heart. But otherwise, until that time, it's good, to, it's good to not say negative things. It's good to not complain. It's good to not criticize outside of the appropriate you know, realm or the appropriate uh, forum. Sometimes it's good to keep your mouth shut just to keep from saying something negative. But there are one or two other examples or times in the, that the Bible talks about where it is good to be still. So let's talk about praying when we're praying. So maybe you have a daily prayer time or a weekly prayer time, regular prayer time. And maybe you go get in your room and shut the door and sit down. And, and it's great to pray. You know, you make requests, you praise the Lord, you cry out to God, you talk to God. And you may be like, oh, I praise you, Lord. And you'd be like, oh, God, I need help with this test coming up. Oh, Lord, I have a coworker. Oh, Lord, I have this problem. Oh, God. And then you can thank him. Thank you for what you did. Thank you for saving my child. Thank you for saving my husband. And, you know, and you can just talk. <laughs> you know, and you can spend half an hour, an hour, three hours just talking. Talk, 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 talk. And prayer is good. And it's good to make your requests known to God. And it's good to, it's good to thank the Lord and praise the Lord. But after a while, <laughs> at some point, it's also good to just be still. Sometimes it's good to just be still in the presence of the Lord. Maybe you've praised and you've repented and you've asked him your, you know, your requests. And after a while, it's, I believe it's just good to just sit there. It's like, okay, Lord, I said all this stuff and now I'm just going to sit here. 
I'm just going to listen. And you don't have to work, and you don't have to worry. All you have to do is just shut up <laughs> and kind of sit there and relax. And maybe during that time, just maybe, the Holy Spirit will come and speak to you. It was good to pray. It was good to stay stuff. But it can also be really good to just sit there and just relax and let the Lord minister to you. There's some Psalms. I don't know that I'm look all these up. But uh, basically, they all talk about being still. Be still and know that I'm God. Or, you know, do not, in, your anger, in your anger, don't sin. But uh, anyway, they just, if you'd like to write them down, please do. You can take them home and look at them. About just be still. It says, I have stilled and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother is my soul within me. I'm still. You know, maybe, or there seems like there's scriptures that talks about during the watches of the night, my heart instructs me. So you can just lie there, lie in your bed, and be still, and let the Lord minister to you. Okay, so, so sometimes it's good to shut up because you don't have anything good to say. Sometimes it's good to shut up because you, you, you don't want to be critical or bitter or angry and express that. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's good to be still just because it's a time where the Holy Spirit can minister to you. And where you can rest, you just soak. Maybe put on some music, and you just soak in the presence of the Lord. Oh, let me tell you this one story. It's one story. First Kings 19, real fast. First Kings 19. This is about Elijah. If you want, you can turn to it. Uh, First Kings 19. And I'll just, well, at the beginning. Anyway, Elijah, the prophet, had had this confrontation with Jezebel, who was the evil queen, and, or this confrontation between the Lord and the prophets of Baal. And the Lord had miraculously answered by fire, sent fire down, and burned up the sacrifice, burned up the altar. It was amazing. And then they killed all the bad guys, all the priests of Baal, and da 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 Well, but uh, Ahab the king and his wife... Well, it says, now Ahab told Jezebel, the bad queen, everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like, like that of one of them. And so Elijah sees God do this mighty thing, mighty victory. And Jezebel says, I'm going to kill you. And so Elijah, it's, it's amazing. He just like, he kind of freaks out. He kind of flips out. It's like, come on, Elijah. You just saw God do this. Don't you think he can protect you from just, anyway, da, 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 da. So Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And so <laughs> he goes and it says, it says he went into the wilderness and he, he sat down and he prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And anyway, it goes on. And he goes up to Horeb, to the mountain of God, and he goes into a cave to spend the night. Elijah goes into this cave to spend the night. And, and God speaks to him and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. And I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Okay, so he's, he's complaining to the Lord, telling the Lord his problem. And the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. So God's like, okay, go stand outside. And so this is the time that I think that I assume, it's not written, but this is, I assume, I assume that Elijah decided to shut up at this point. He was like, oh, 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 you know, complaining. But at this point, he goes out, and I'm pretty sure he didn't say anything. And this is what it says happened. It says, then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper or a still small voice. 
When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And then the Lord speaks to him, you know, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he, he repeats his complaint. But then the Lord gives him instructions. And the Lord, among other things, says, Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. So the Lord speaks to him and basically says, Elijah, you're not the only one. You are not alone. There are 7,000, you know, people who have not compromised and still, who, who still love me. But when the Lord spoke to him, I believe he had to be silent because he, he went out and he, you know, stood by the mouth of the cave, whatever, and, and there, was, there was a wind and there was a fire and there was an earthquake. But, but then, but what he heard was a still small voice. He heard the gentle whisper. And I believe that had Elijah been talking still, then he would not have heard the still small voice. He wouldn't have heard the whisper. So I believe that just for us in our lives, it's good in our prayer times, sometimes to just sit there and be still. Sit there and shut up. This is the last thing. This is the last part. Jesus was still. Oh, oh, hold on. Jesus was still. Let me read, like, let me read in Matthew, Matthew 26. Jesus, you know, he, he did his ministry here on earth, and then in the last days, the very last day or two, whatever, he was crucified, but he was brought, you know, there was a trial of sorts, and uh, we're going to read some about that in Matthew. Okay, Matthew 26. We're almost done. Matthew 26, verse 62. That's a long chapter. This is what it says. The high priest, then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, well, let me back up, okay? They were giving, they were accusing Jesus, okay? They were mad at Jesus. They didn't like Jesus. They were trying to find a reason to kill him, okay? And so they were making accusations, blah, 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 blah. And uh, it says they couldn't find any evidence against him, though many false witnesses came forward. And so blah, 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 it says, the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? So all these men are, bringing, are saying bad things about Jesus. Jesus did this. Jesus said this. And by and large, it was, it was false. And, you know, he hadn't done anything bad. And the high priest is like, well, what are you, aren't you going to speak up? Aren't you going to defend yourself? And the Bible says Jesus remained silent. Jesus didn't say anything at that point. And, you know, later on he had things to say, but at that point he remained silent. Then later in chapter 27, in verse 12, verses 12 and 14, so now Jesus has gone from the Jewish leadership, now he's before the Roman leadership. Now he's before Pilate, okay? Okay, and it says, Meanwhile, Jesus stood, well, stood before the governor, okay? And, uh, and he says, are you the king of the Jews? And he says, you, you know, you have said so. And then, it says, when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. So again, you know, the Jews come up and they're saying bad things about him. And the governor's there. And Jesus just doesn't say anything. He doesn't say, that's not true. You bunch of liars. You made that up. He doesn't say that. And Pilate asks him, don't you hear the testimony they're bringing against you? It says, but Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge to the great amazement of the governor. Jesus didn't say anything when they accused him, when they said he'd done bad things. He didn't speak up in his own defense. And this is the third time that I want to talk about today where it's good, where it's powerful to shut up. So Jesus was the word of God to man. Jesus was the word become flesh. Jesus was the prophet of all prophets, the teacher of all teachers, you know, the preacher of all preachers. Jesus, if anybody had anything good to say, Jesus did. But in that moment when he was accused, he didn't say anything. Jesus didn't feel any need that compelled him to defend himself. Now the question is why? Well, I have, a, I have an idea or two. For one, I'm afraid that if he had defended himself, his words would have been so powerful that they would have released him and he never would have died on the cross and he would not have fulfilled the mission that he came to do. Okay, 
That's, I think that's, that's, that's probably a pretty good reason that had he spoken, they would not have been able to, to stand his words and he wouldn't have died on the cross for us. So he chose to keep silent. He chose to keep silent, okay? But another reason, well, another reason may have been that he was secure in himself and he didn't feel any need to have to defend himself. He knew who he was. He knew he was his father's son. And sometimes I think when we feel secure, it makes us less apt to feel the need to defend ourselves. But this is another reason. I believe he did it to, to fulfill scripture. And this is the last scripture I have today. This is Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. And this was spoken, you know, hundreds, thousands of years before. But we believe that it talks about, it's really talking about Jesus. And this is what it says about him. And this is an awesome, I love this passage of scripture. So just, just listen. It says, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He, meaning Jesus, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he bore our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each, is, each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is the last verse I want to read. He was oppressed and afflicted, and yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. So the prophet Isaiah spoke this hundreds or thousands of years before. And he was talking, he may not have realized it, but he was talking about Jesus. That Jesus' blood would cover our sins. And Jesus' wounds would bring us healing. Okay, that Jesus' death would bring us life, basically. And in this prophecy, in the prophecy, it says, As a sheep before those who shear its hair off, shear its wool off, as a sheep before the shearers is silent, you know, so he did not open his mouth. So why didn't Jesus open his mouth? I think one reason was he did it to fulfill prophecy. He knew that was written about him, and he knew that was the right thing to do at the time. He knew this person who had everything to say knew that it was time to just be still. So that's pretty much all I have today. In res you know, to sum up, there are three times I think it's good to shut up, to not talk. One is when you don't have anything to good to say, when you've got bitter waters or anger. And if you do, I encourage you to deal with that or to seek the Lord or come get prayer. You know, let somebody help you deal with the anger and the bitterness inside you, the hurt, so that those bitter waters can be removed. Another time that's good to be still is when we're having our prayer time, you know, our daily or whatever regular devotional time or when we're in worship, and it's good after we've said, our, said everything we had to say to just sit and be still and listen for what the Lord has to say. But then there was another time that somebody was still, that it was Jesus, and because he, he, he walked in the fulfillment of that prophecy, because he didn't speak up to defend himself, he was able, he was able to fulfill the mission that his father had sent him to do. And... You know, and he died on the cross and he bought our justification. He bought your place in heaven. He bought your healing. He bought, he bought your peace. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. So Jesus, Jesus knew the power. He knew it was time to not say anything. And he did it. Praise God. This is the last slide. This is just... A funny, another funny little saying, never miss a good opportunity to shut up. 
Listen, there's a lot of opportunities to say all kinds of things, but there's a time to be silent. There's a time to be silent. So, man, it's a powerful, there's power in the word no, but sometimes there's also power in just not saying anything at all. And that's all I have. I'm going to close this in prayer. Now, next week, I would like to talk about the opposite, the power of speaking up, the power of speaking out. But that's a whole other topic. So being silent isn't always the answer, but sometimes it is. So let's just close and you'll be dismissed pretty much. Dear Jesus, I thank you that when you stood before Pilate, you stood before the Pharisees or, you know, the, the Jews, Lord, that you did not defend yourself. And I thank you. I thank you. Lord, you needed no defense. You were, you were, you had committed no crime. You were worthy of no punishment. But you forfeited your right. You forfeited your rights. And you laid down your life so that you, so that you could buy us healing and peace and forgiveness and eternal life. And I thank you so much. And Lord, I pray that even this morning, if there are bitter waters, that they would be cured. They would be cured by the salt of grace and by the power of the cross. Pray that people's hurts would be healed and their anger would be, would just, you know, would just be snuffed out. Lord, I pray that we would not give our mouths to gossip and to complaining and criticism when those things aren't merited, when those, when those things aren't the right thing to do. Lord, I pray that when we come before you in worship and prayer, that we would learn to be silent, to be still at times, and to receive everything that you want to give us. Lord, but, but more than that, God, I pray that, uh, getting into next week, Lord, but I pray that you would teach us when is the right time, not only when is the right time to be still, but when is the right time to speak up and declare the word of the Lord. Lord, say something positive, something uplifting, something seasoned with salt and full of grace. So God, thank you for everybody here. God, help us to, God, I just pray, uh, seal this word, put it deep in our hearts. God, let it, let it produce a harvest a hundredfold. I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, praise you, God. Amen.